Yes, good afternoon. We're just about ready to get started. My name is Michael Kelker. I teach English at St. Charles Community College, and I've also been the organizer of Democracy Days 2001 to present. Thank you very much for being here. We have Kurt Barr, the Director of Elections in St. Charles County, ready to speak. He is an expert in the subject, and in terms of democracy, few things are as important as free, fair, secure, bona fide elections. So this is vitalizing material that we're going to encounter. And I know that he will uh, want to entertain questions from you, the audience. This is Kurt Barr's third appearance. He formerly served as a Republican member of the State House of Representatives from 2011 to 2019. And since then, he has served as Director of Elections in St. Charles County. Let's welcome our guest. Well, I appreciate that. All right, this mic is working well. Let me move this down. Just a smidge. All right. So today's presentation is going to be over what I consider the, the two overarching philosophies of elections. And those two are accessibility, access to the ballot, and security, making sure that the result is the will of the people. Um, however, just yesterday, I went down to Jeff City for a um, hearing, and they were not necessarily hearing a bill because the session isn't in session. Today is what's called veto session. So Governor Parson vetoed a couple of bills, and the legislature has the opportunity to override those. They won't because, well, they just won't. But that's what they're, they're down there today. So yesterday they had a hearing just to talk about the idea of photo ID. And the Missouri House passed a bill this year in the earlier session to require the showing of a photo ID for voting. Driver's license, passport, uh, school ID with name in it and, and uh, um, name, with picture and name. Um, and then, you know, so that was what they were discussing. Um, however, at the same time, I got an email uh, saying that the U.S. Congress, specifically the U.S. Senate, is working on a new scaled-down version of SB1 or HB1. They now call that the Freedom to Vote Act. Um, this particular legislation, I was able to, it's 592 pages long, so if you want a quick, easy read, um, Sandra Klobuchar has the bill on her website. Uh, that's where I found it. Um, but uh, you know, the table of contents is like three pages long in of itself, and it focuses a lot on access to the polls. Who can vote? How long can uh, people vote? And so I just, I just thought it was kind of interesting how the, you know, the, how the, the current Congress and the current General Assembly are both very much focused on elections, election administration, but they are each taking a different tact on these two, I call the two primary uh, election values, that of accessibility and that of security. So accessibility means a lot of different things. One, it can just mean you know, ADA access to a polling location. Are we voting in a polling location that has a wheelchair ramp, that has wide enough hallways, that has you know, all of the other features that would be necessary for somebody to easily access the physical location for voting? Do we have ADA accessible ballot marking devices? Do we have something other than just a piece of paper that somebody uh, has to actually be able to physically see in order to vote? Uh, accessibility can be early voting or absentee voting. The issue of time is elections, election day only. The one, do, one thing I do like about that uh, federal law is they want to make the November general election a, an actual uh, U.S. holiday so that everybody would be off so that you could go vote. Um, and so early voting. And then the other thing that the uh, Freedom to Vote Act requires is 15 days of, of early voting, including weekends, which I have my own thoughts on that. But, you know, if, you know that's why I say all this like, access to the polls. Um, accessibility can also be um, registration deadlines. In the state of Missouri, to be able to vote 
for the upcoming election, you must register four weeks before that election date. And it's never a fun conversation when you tell somebody, I'm sorry, you lived here in the county for a year, you didn't update your voter registration until yesterday, you're not allowed to cast a ballot. And I've had to have that conversation. It's never a fun conversation. Nobody ever likes hearing that. Other states have same day voter registration. You show up to the election authority office and say, I want to vote. And you update your registration that day and you vote. You know, there's different rules on all of that. Um, voter notification of elections. There's an interesting conversation debate. What is the role of the election minister in telling people about the election? Is it the job of the candidates to get voters out? Is it the job of the county election official to get people to the polls? And then mail ballots, whether it's early voting or absentee, are they sent solicited or unsolicited? There are four states, uh, Washington, Arizona, California, uh, Colorado, where if you are a registered voter in that state, they will mail you a ballot whether you want it or not. Most states have you know, some requirement on the voter to ask for the ballot. In Missouri, we have absentee voting, and so you must request a ballot for each and every election. Some states, you can say, hey, for this year, if there's an election I qualify for, give it to me. Um, so that is, uh, all these things are elements of accessibility. Um, ballot return. Now that you have the ballot, how do you get it back? Do you have to put it in the mail? Does it have to be notarized? Do you, is there a drop box that you can drop it in? Can you just hand it to somebody who promises that they will take it to the election authority as opposed to accidentally throw it away because they know what party you are and they don't like that? All of these things are uh, accessibility. Um, and then when uh, can you receive, you know, when, can, when should the election authority count a ballot? Does, can an absentee ballot be received after election day? and it still count. In Missouri, we only allow military and overseas civilians a few extra days for their ballots to come into our office and still count. So it still must be postmarked the day of the election. So you can't see the election results and go, my guy lost, I'm gonna cast my ballot now. But because the mail system, especially from overseas mail system, it's a little bit uh, more cumbersome, we give them a few extra days. And then, of course, list maintenance, the whole voter registration process. So all of these things are elements of access and accessibility to election. Then there's the security, all right? Physical security of the polling location. Part of that is we deliver all of our stuff before the election day. And so making sure that the stuff we deliver is still there and not misplaced or, or tampered with is a concern of election administration. Paper ballots. It wasn't that long ago, well, pre-2016, that the big thing was voting on a tablet and then that vote just being recorded. And then 2016 election caused people to say, we need an audible paper trail. And so now the, what we call DREs, direct reporting equipment, th those are going away very, very quickly. Um, audits, pre-audits, post-audits, you're making sure that the, the tabulating machines work and work correctly and make sure that the votes that were cast were the votes that were counted in the way that they were cast. So all of these things are elements of security. Again, registration deadlines. One of the reasons for specifically the four-week deadline is back in the day before things were more computerized and before our state was on one statewide registration system, it's called MCVR, Missouri Centralized Voter Record. It would take time for the different counties to communicate with each other. Um, actually, the Boone County, Mizzou, was the last to get online. That was only two years ago. And so you could be a St. Charles County resident, go off to Mizzou, you could be registered here, you could be registered at Mizzou, neither of us would know, and you could illegally vote in both places, and we wouldn't know until after the election. Now being on one system, that is, you know, that if you go to Mizzou now and you register to vote there, Boone, Boone County will take you from St. Charles and register you in Boone County. You come back here and your parents are like, well, you need to register to vote here. Then 
make sure you register within four weeks, and then we will bring you back into St. Charles, but we'll take you out of Boone County. That's one of the security elements of having a statewide database. But that time lag of making sure that somebody can't vote twice at one election is an issue of voter registration deadlines. All right. the, obviously, the counting of the ballots, that is a huge issue right now. I'll get into in another slide. Chain of custody of ballots. How do I know that that ballot is that per voter's ballot and it was counted and somebody somewhere along the way didn't touch it, modify it, you know, overly assist in the, the, the uh, voting of that ballot? So all of this is an issue of, of security. Um, Again, uh, voter verification, signature verification, making sure that the person who says, I'm here to vote, is that person. Again, photo ID laws and would fall under this one. Um, mail ballots received by election day versus after election day. Um, and then, of course, list maintenance. Having living people, as opposed to those who've passed away or moved out of the jurisdiction on the rolls. And so there, I'll get into a little bit of, of, of how both list maintenance is an accessibility issue as well as a security issue. All right, so starting with last first, list maintenance. By this, I mean voter registration, getting on the rolls so that you can vote, all right? So you can, you can uh, register to vote by going to the Secretary of State's website and registering online. That's a new feature in the last four years. Definitely increases accessibility, and it has become the number one way most people register to vote. I'd say nearly half of our voter registrations are people registering to vote online through the Secretary of State's website. The other most common way is at the DMV. Going and updating your voter, going to update your driver's license and registering at that time. Now, one thing that we've asked the DMV to do, instead of saying, are you registered to vote? Because you could be from another state or another county, and you're like, well, yeah, I'm registered back there. We ask them, are you registered to vote at this address? Because voting is all about where you live, making sure you get to vote for your school district, your state representative, your congressman, you know, your alderman, all of these positions. And so we have to know where you live so we can make sure we give you your ballot. Because at any given election, I have 100 to 300 different ballots based on where people live within the county. St. Louis County, it's like four or 5,000 ballots. It's in, you know, much, much more diverse geographical social or political map over there. And so making sure that people are in the rolls, registered at their address is an important thing. Now, making sure that people who no longer live here are not on the rolls is also an important thing. I always want to make sure people understand, if you don't vote, that doesn't mean we kick you off the rolls. It's against federal law, and we just don't do it. And so I always put, put that out, because there's, there's a misconception that, well, if you don't vote enough, you're going to get kicked off the rolls. That's, that's not the case. You can be a registered voter for decades. As long as you don't move, you're good to go. All right? Voters are responsible for updating their records. If you move within the county, if you move from one county to another, Elections are very county specific. And so it's your job to update your record. It is, in St. Charles County, we have about, I think it's 10% of the population moves each year. And with a 400,000 population, that means 40,000 people are moving within the year. I have no way of knowing who those 40,000 are. Now we have some ways of kind of knowing, but it's, you know, it's not the voter's job to make sure they get their voter registration updated. All right, now we have two terms that we primarily use about voters. We call them active voters and inactive voters. An active voter means you register to vote and you live where you told me you live. You're good to go, you show up at election day and you're gonna get the right ballot. Inactive voter means you have registered to vote. However, I'm pretty sure you moved. The number one way that I know this is I tried to send you a piece of mail saying, hey, by the way, election's coming up, and the post office sends it back to me. It says, hey, this person no longer lives here. Or before I do that, I can actually run a report through the post office's system, it's called the uh, National Change of Address List, and find out who's, whose name and address no longer match. All right, so this is, what, and then we just, we flag them. An inactive voter can still vote. 
You show up at the polling place, you can still vote. But what I need is to get your correct address into the system so I can give you your correct ballot. And so we don't give you your ballot till we get your address right. Sometimes that means on election day, we're like, oh, you need to go to the polling place down the street because you know, they have your ballot and we don't. Um, or most of the time, however, people move. They ask their neighbor, where's our polling location? They say, well, it's a community college down the street. And so they show up to the community college and, and then they vote. And then you know, the, the system will say, well, you're supposed to be over at the middle school around town. And they're like, well, I moved. And so most people are usually at the right place and they just haven't updated the record. But they are still registered voter. They will still get to vote. All right. Now, to keep under the security aspect of the voter records. Uh, in 1993, we had what's called the NVRA, National Voter Registration Act, and it has a process for keeping the rolls clean. All right, so um, every two years before each federal election, I have to send out a voter, vote, voter ID card. And this card is gonna say, here's your polling location, here's your precinct you're assigned to, here's all your political subdivisions that you get to vote in, all right? And, and then it'll even have the little barcode that you can scan at the iPad, and then that, you know, and so we'll send those out about June of next year, uh, before the August and November primaries of next year, all right? But before we send that out, we run that NCOA report, and we see, well, who's moved? Who, no, who, who is a registered voter who the post office says no longer lives there? And then we send that population of people what we call an RCN, Residency Confirmation Notice. We send them a letter, say, hey, we're pretty sure you moved. Tell us where you live. Sometimes they send back, say, I haven't moved. In which case, we, we you know, make them active again. Like, okay, well, obviously the system was wrong. A lot of times, like, oh yeah, I, I moved from St. Charles, I now live in Winsville, here's my new address. Um, or they'll, they'll even tell us, no, I no longer live here, I've now moved over to Florida. And so then at that point, we'll just take that letter, scan it into the system, admit it to their uh, record, and then delete them. And they're no longer an active voter in our county. And then you know, in that letter, we tell them, hey, if you no longer live here, make sure you register at your existing county. I, I, even though I can see registered voters throughout the entire state, I can't make you a registered voter in some other county. I only have control of St. Charles County. I can't add anybody to another county, all right? So all of this is a process that was, uh, was fleshed out under federal law um, in uh, 93, all right? Then another thing that we do, again, more on the line of accessibility, is we send out a notification card, all right? St. Louis County, they actually print a larger card and have the whole sample ballot on it. Well. The larger the piece of mail is, the more expensive the piece of mail is. I'm cheap with my own money and taxpayers' money. So I put a QR code on it with a little bit.ly. Unfortunately, the older people don't know what that means. Um, they also don't know how to see the new bit.ly code versus like the one they looked at last time they were at the restaurant. And so they'll call me and say, hey, your, your QR code's wrong. It's a menu for the, the Applebee's. I'm like, no, you just don't know how to use your phone. Anyway, but the QR code will give you your sample ballot. So a way so that you can see you know, what your sample ballot's gonna look like without spending a lot of money you know, printing a very large card. But the other thing that we do is we only send this to one household um, because we were having an issue where you know, specifically father, son, senior, junior, or husband, wife, they would grab the wrong card and then they would vote because it used to have the barcode on it. And then, you know, then the child, the spouse would show up, and they're like, oh, I'm sorry, you've already voted. No, I haven't. It's like it says right here, you already voted. You voted in the morning, and this is the afternoon. It was, it was sadly a somewhat common thing. We found out that it was somebody within their own household grabbing the wrong card, not paying attention, and my election judges not doing their due diligence to double check to make sure that the person in front of them matched the name. Anyway, it, you know, it's, and so we now only send one to household because these are a courtesy from the county. Some counties don't provide them. Um, again, St. Louis County, they provide one to every, every voter with a whole sample ballot, but they're not elected directors of elections, so they can spend more money. I like getting reelected, so I spend less money. Now, when you go to vote, the first thing you're gonna do is you're going to check in. This is where, again, the list maintenance, the voter registration you know, applies at election day. 
These iPads, you know, we, we call them pole pads. Um, actually, No Ink, the company that, that makes them, is based out of St. Louis, um, which so it's nice to have a, a local vendor that's really now na nationwide in, in voter access. These pads have the entire list of all the voters within the county. And so when I was your age and I was first voting, I had to go in to the, what was that, MK Library in Highway K, and there was a list. You know, if your last name was A through M, you went to this line. If your list, if your name was, last name was N through Z, you were in this line. And, you know, unfortunately, inevitably, whichever name you were, that's where everybody else was too. Like everybody voted by alphabet. Um, so you're always in the wrong line. But these things obviously make the line go a lot quicker. The other thing is if you had absentee voted or if you had requested an absentee ballot, um, if you had voted earlier in the day, these machines are cellular and they're talking you know, to the cloud all the time. So they're perpetually updated. So you can't show up in the morning, vote, and then come back later in the day, try to vote at a different iPad in the same place or even a different precinct. And because, well, no, I'm sorry, you've already voted. So this is a, an element of, of security. I have a, there is a group of people who are trying to say that to make elections secure, no election equipment can touch the internet. Unfortunately, the word election equipment would mean pull pads. So to make elections secure, we need to make sure the election authority doesn't know if somebody voted earlier in the day or not. Um, that's where I try to educate people on, you know, on what security, you know, good security means and less, you know, less good security means and what accessibility does and doesn't mean. All right, so, so election day, you pull up, you, you scan your back of your ID card. That's always, you know, the back of your driver's license is always the fastest way because it, you know, your voter record has your driver's license number. And so we know, you know, based on that, we know your record. We know who you are, where that you're registered. But we don't, in Missouri, currently the, um, the, number of elements of ID are broad. College ID, perfectly acceptable. A, a utility statement, except for a cell phone bill, is acceptable. Um, you know, and, and then, you know, obviously a number of other forms of ID are all acceptable. All right. Then another element of election equipment and accessibility is what was called a ballot marking device. Now, whoop, I went, oh yeah, my slide about pull pads. Uh, I talked about that. All right, ballot marking devices. Um, so under the Help America Vote Act of 2002, um, there was a requirement for more technology within elections, but there's also a requirement for more ADA access in elections. And so these machines, which in our county, so this is the machine that we use here in St. Charles County. It's called the FVT. It's uh, made by a company called Unison out of San Diego, um, and it is a touchscreen. It will also read to you the ballot. So if you are blind or have vision impairment, you can listen to the ballot and it will read it to you. And it's a nice, slow Google voice. Um, you can speed it up, slow it down. A uh, couple other things. It also has a, a touchpad, brightly colored buttons, braille. So if you are blind or, again, you can you know, select through the, the process that way. We even have a sip and puff attachment. So if that's the only way that you can communicate. And I tried voting on a sip and puff. It is doable is uh, difficult in that it, you know, sip and puff, you, you know, you know it's, it's yes, no, it's, it's uh, binomial. So suck means one thing, blow means something else, and you, know, you go through the whole process by doing those two functions. Um, and so it's a little bit tedious, but if that's the only way that you can cast a ballot, then, uh oh, somebody forgot to turn the phone off. I don't know who that is. All right. Um, so this is a way that you know, anybody with a, an impairment, whether it's a physical, or I'm sorry, a visual impairment, or whether their hand is, you know, they're unable to fill in the, the squares, the targets of the ballot easily, and a touch screen works for them. Uh, the screen will also turn dark, and so it's a black-white contrast. Some, for some people, that's what they need. And so this machine will, you know, go through the whole process, go through the whole ballot, and then it prints the paper ballot in a form that kind of looks like a receipt. But that paper receipt is, you know, has the selection you know, printed out. I voted for this candidate, this candidate, this candidate. I voted yes or no for this issue. And then it has a bunch of little squares. And the little squares is what the machine reads. And then obviously the top part is what any judge would read if they were doing a 
recount or a, 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 you know, a manual uh, inspection of the ballots. And so then that then goes into the, the tabulating machine, which is what we call an OVO. This is the, just the, the version of a tabulator that we currently use in St. Charles County. Again, it's made by the Unison Company out of San Diego. Um, and it's called an OVO, Open Elect Voting Optical Scan. So it is quite simply a camera, front and back, and it is a, a little memory device, so it ta and then it has a little, little computer in it that tabulates up the, the record. It is a little, nice little device that basically looks for targets, and if it sees a darkened spot, it knows this darkened spot means a yes vote, a no vote, a vote for this candidate. And if it doesn't see that, it, it records no vote. And then this machine is what on election day is tabulating the elections for any one polling place. And then after the election is over, they all have a thumb drive in them. And those thumb drives, as well as all the voted ballots, come back to our office. And then we centralize and tabulate for the entire county and then report the results election night. This, of course, is where um, there's a certain group of people who talk about there's um, Russian modems inside these machines that are changing the outcome of the election, which is, is kind of a, a fun conspiracy theory. Unfortunately, there's too many people who are spouting it. And so, you know, I, they're like, at the, again, yesterday's meeting, this one guy's like, you know, we can't get in there to see the machine. I'm like, well, I can. I know there's no Russian Muslims in there. They're not connected to the internet. Anyway, they're completely programmed with thumb drives. And then we have, the way I know that they work is we have a lot of testing, a lot of auditing. Again, let's focusing on the, the security side of elections. I want to make sure that my machines work because, again, I want to get reelected. And so, obviously, the only way for me to do that is to write good elections. Um, so, we have what we call logic, logic and accuracy tests. We're just going to make sure the machines work. And so, we have a predetermined list of ballots that have every target of an election on it. And we run that through the machine. For the first thing, it is just to make sure the machine sees every target. Because if it just didn't see a candidate, that'd be a big problem. If it didn't see the yes vote or the no vote for an issue, you know, that would be a big problem. And so we just make sure the machine works. And if for whatever reason it doesn't work, we either fix it or we put it off to the side because we have a few extras. And then we'll you know, fix it later. Um, most of the time, if the machine's not working, it's because like one side of it's just not reading and we just have to fix the scanner. It's just a technical issue. All right, we also do this test to the public. It's called a public test. I have to, before every election, post, you know, post on my website and I have to you know, uh, post it up and notice saying, hey, I'm going to be testing my machines and we allow anybody in the public to show up. I usually get two or three people um, out of a county of 400,000 and I let them pick. It's like, hey, any machine that we're going to use, you get to pick the machine and we're going to run the test. And they will pick whichever machine they choose to pick and then we'll run the test and we'll show them the results and we'll explain to them how the math works because there's a a systematic way of seeing that, you know, the election result on that test deck, it comes across in a very uniform way. And if there's any anomaly, it is obvious in the way we do it. And then, of course, we have a lot of post-election tests. I want to make sure that the election I'm certifying is correct. And so we'll do a number of, of different things with, with the machine. One, we'll take one precinct, we'll take the machine, and we'll rerun all the ballots for an entire precinct. And obviously, the one thing we want is for that result to be the same as election night. And if it's not, then we got to figure out why. Um, you know, because obviously, we, you know, we want the election results to be right. The other thing that we'll do is we'll, we'll take a random sampling of elections, and we'll hand count those precincts and ballots. So we'll, we'll randomly pick precinct 12. And then we'll say, we're going to look at the governor's race for precinct 12. And then we'll pick another precinct and we'll say, okay, we're going to look at the presidential race for that precinct. And then we have one Republican, one Democrat. They'll, one of them will read off the names and the other one will, will check it off. And then they switch and they do it again. And then obviously we want the election night result from the machine and we want the two recounts to be the same. When they're not, which is rare, but sometimes they're not, it's usually off by one or two and then the judges realize that they made a mistake while while tallying. So these people who say we need to do everything by hand count, honestly, the machines are far more accurate than the, uh, the judges are. All right. So continuing on with the theme of election day voting, we're going to talk about an element of accessibility. So again, under federal law, 
um, there is what's called a provisional ballot. Voter shows up at a polling place, they say, I'm here to vote, I'm a, I'm a registered voter. And the iPad says, I don't know who this person is. You know, you try scanning your ID, you try typing in your name, the j election judge calls us and says, hey, so-and-so claims to be a voter. And we're going to try looking up your name and we're like, I don't see you. And you're like, I want to vote. You have what is called a provisional ballot. So you can still vote and then we segregate that ballot into this envelope. On the back of the envelope is a little tab. You, you, the judge rips that off, hands it to you. It has a little number on it. It's a tracking code. You can call us up and say, hey, did my, did my ballot get counted? And so what we're going to do is on that envelope, the voter fills out their name, their address. They sign it. They're, they're saying, I am who I say I am, and I'm a registered voter, and I want to vote. All right. And we go through. Most of the time, what we find out is that you know, somebody is legally Thomas, and they go by Tom, or William and go by Bill, or, or they go by their middle name. And it's some sort of clerical error where the system is looking for specifically Thomas, not Tom, or is looking for Bill and not William. And so these clerical errors, based on how you register to vote, so again, list maintenance matters, making sure that we spell the names right. Uh, I had one clerk, I found out, um, they had a problem with O's and zeros. They would, like anybody who's like an O'Donnell or you know, O'Neill, they would, they would type a zero. So we, you know, the, it, you know, the human eye can't see that, but you take the list, you put it in Excel, and then you sort it, and then all of a sudden, you know, Excel shows you all kinds of fun things. Like, why are all of these people with the last name of, you know, starts with an O, you know, at the very top of the list? This makes no sense. Like, oh, those are zeros. So then we have to go into our system and we have to fix all that. And then we do a little staff training. Hey, by the way, O's and zeros, they mean things. They mean different things. So it could be a clerical error. Or somebody truly didn't register to vote. Or they're still registered in another state or whatever, and they don't understand the difference that you have to be registered in. Anyway, if, however, it's our error, you are a registered voter, you're at the right spot, then we will you know, double check, make sure you're good to go, and then we will count that ballot. What I do is I have what's called a verification board. So I have a representative from the two political parties, so one Republican, one Democrat, who come to my office after the election, and then they will look at the number of people who voted at each polling place and the number of ballots I say were cast at each polling place to make sure those numbers match. Again, another element of security, so that my election judges couldn't just throw in a whole bunch of ballots you know, at the end of the night so that their preferred candidate you know, won. Um, so it's just a, a, a check on that. Um, and so we'll go over, and then my, my staff will first go through and by law, some, some elements, some reasons, somebody casting a provisional ballot, we should not count it, and some we should, some is slightly questionable. So we take it to the verification board. We say, here's a list of people who we know are good voters and their ballots should be counted. Here's a list of people, they, they didn't meet the qualification of law. And then sometimes you get an issue where they sign the wrong spot. Like, well, technically they didn't sign here, but we have their signature. You know, I generally say we take that ballot, even though they didn't properly, fully fill it out. We try to give the you know, tie to the voter. Then, under state law, under the original photo ID law, we have a different type of provisional ballot. And blue enveloped, we just call it the blue provisional. This is for a voter who is a registered voter but doesn't have any form of identification. You show up to vote, you got nothing on you. I don't understand that. My wallet is always on my person. But some people, they just leave it in their car or they just leave it at home. You know, they're you know, trying to vote from the gym. I don't know. Um, so you have no proof of identification. But you swear you're a voter. So here, again, very similar to the yellow one, you just fill out all the information, and you got two choices. You can come back later that day, show the judge your ID. They'll put a little sticker on it saying, yep, they're good to go, you know, count this ballot. They don't open it and put it in the tabulator that, that night. They give it to us, and we do it for them. Or we go through the system. We double check to make sure that your name and address are, in fact, a registered voter. We look at the signature, all matches, good to go, and then we count those ballots. So you can vote in St. Charles County with absolutely no ID whatsoever. You just have to vote this provisional ballot and we have to figure it out after the election. So these are elements of both security and accessibility within elections. All right. Now, all of that is really election day voting. Let's talk about the before election day voting. So first, let's talk about just by mail ballots. All right. All right. So, um, 
in Missouri, you have to ask for an absentee ballot for each election. This, this gives a, an element of security in that if you had recently moved and you say, hey, I want this ballot and here's my address, and it's different than your current address, we can use that application, update your record, and then give you the correct ballot. Like, oh, well, you moved to a different state senate district, so we're going to make sure we give you the correct state senator on your ballot, you know, that kind of thing. Um, it also, you know, we're not sending ballots to somebody who doesn't want one, um, so you have to ask for one. But in Missouri, you also have to, like, well, I'll get that next slide. All right. Um, and so then, you know, all the applications, we get them in, we process them, and then, you know, we'll send out the ballots. Absentee voting in Missouri starts six weeks before the election, and so we will not send out any ballots until six weeks before the election, but generally we'll send out a big load the first day. You know, that, that, you know, that. So for the November election, that, that we're having a small special election in November this year. So for that, so September 22nd is the six week mark. So on Tuesday, September 22nd, we will send out absentee ballots for anybody who's requested one. Um, all right, but then we get the ballots back. And so we'll double check to make sure that the person who requested the ballot is the same person who signed on the back of the ballot. Depending on why you ask for the absentee ballot, some people have to have a notary, some people don't. It, I put that on the envelope. I make sure, I make it as easy as possible for people to know, here are the rules. Do this, I count your ballot. Don't do this, then your ballot goes in the bed pile. And I don't like doing that. Um, there is um, a process, so I cannot count absentee ballots until election day. Uh, the Thursday before an election, I can start to open the envelopes, smooth them out, and make sure that they didn't get destroyed in the mail. Because sometimes a, a ballot will get so damaged, the machine won't take it. In which case, then we have to recreate it. So I get a Republican and Democrat, they sit down together, and they rewrite your ballot exactly as you voted it, and then they'll, they'll cast that clean paper copy, and then we save all of the, the damaged ones. Sometimes it's the post office that does it, sometimes the voters spilled coffee on it, and then they send it to us, um, but you know, it could just not, not read correctly. All right, and then again, um, absentee ballots, if you are uniform overseas military voters, then you get two and a half days extra to get your ballot in. Everybody else, I have to have your ballot by, a, by the close of the polls, election day. And so we'll always go to the post office election day, you know, towards the end of the afternoon, and I've actually learned the process to know when they have their mail. And so we'll go in and we'll say, hey, got any last minute ballots? Sometimes they have a lot. Uh, actually, the, the crazy thing is in the November presidential election, uh, we went all the way to St. Louis to see if there was any, any ballots that were in the, the main St. Louis uh, post office. They had two. And I sent like three people, four people down there, thinking that I was going to carry buckets of ballots back. They had two. So they did a pretty good job getting me the ballots earlier, which I was happy for. All right. Now, in, again, in Missouri, in St. Charles County, you have to have a reason to vote absentee. All right. So it, it is less accessible. Some some states, you, you can just vote by mail, All right, which I'm going to get to in the next slide. But in Missouri, you have to have a reason. So if you're not going to be here in St. Charles County Election Day, again, absentee voting is under the precept concept, you'll be absent Election Day. You're voting absentee. All right? So states like ours that have absentee rules is because we focus on Election Day voting. And so you're just like, hey, I'm not going to be here Election Day. Well, it could be that you're off at you know, Truman or Mizzou. It could be that you know, you're just not going to be here Election Day. So you can request an absentee ballot. Um, there's what's called incapacity uh, or confinement due to illness or injury. Um, obviously, you know, we broadened that last year with COVID. Um, and then last year, the legislature even created a new category if you're at risk of COVID. The problem was I had thousands of people illegally vote because they said, well, we're all at risk of COVID which was technically true, but the legislature defined what at risk meant, and it was a more limited population than the number of people who voted in my office. However, you know, I'm not allowed to ask, are you, are you really diabetic? You know, are you really this age? Do you really have this ailment? So if they tell me that they you know, are, are uh, at risk, I have to take it face value. Religious belief or practice, I don't know what that means, but that's an acceptable reason. Uh, employment as an election judge. So if you're gonna work as an election judge, Obviously, we want you to vote absentee. And the reason for that is, if you work at a polling place not your own, I don't want you leaving your polling place, going to some other polling place, going and vote, and then coming back, because now I've lost the election judge for how long? 
and then that slows up the whole, the whole line. So please, if you work as an election judge, vote absentee. Um, I did find out I actually had one employee that got so busy with the election they forgot to vote. Um, I was like, really? He had six weeks. It was in our office for six weeks. They just forgot to vote. Um, so I try to remind my employees, by the way, don't forget to vote. Um, if you're, uh, obviously, if you're active military, you're not going to be here. And so you can absentee vote. Uh, if you're going to be incarcerated, um, you know, th th actually, uh, this is kind of interesting in that, you know, there's different states have different levels of of voting for those who are incarcerated. So if you know that you're going to be in the county jail down over on 2nd Street election day, but you haven't actually been convicted of any felony, you haven't lost your right to vote, then you can vote absentee. Some states, Vermont being the most accessible on this, they actually go into the prisons and vote people while who are actively incarcerated. They are the most accessible. Most states have a rule that if you're in prison, you don't get to vote. Uh, the, again, that, that federal law that they're proposing right now, I told you it focuses more on accessibility. Uh, that would override all state laws and say that anybody who is out of prison gets to vote. So even if they're still on probation, still on parole, still owe restitution, they would be allowed to vote. In our state, anybody who is... You know, incarcerated, on probation, on parole, or owes restitution to their victim. If you're in any of those categories, you're not allowed to vote. After you're out of the penal system, then you get your voting rights restored back to you. Unless you commit what's called an election offense. So basically, you commit a felony that deals with elections itself, and then you never get to vote. But it's very rare that that happens. So, you know, so there, there again is an element of I don't know if you want to call it security, but generally society likes to punish people who go into the penal system as much as possible, so they keep them out of civil society as long as possible by you know, denying the right to vote until the latest possible point. But you know, anyway, again, I'm a big believer in local control of elections as opposed to federal control. All right, so incarceration, you can still vote. And then uh, what's called certification, participation, and address confinement program. Basically, this is domestic abuse. abuse. If you are, you know, if you're dealing with a situation where you have an abuser and you're in basically a type of witness protection, you don't want your abuser to know your address, you know, we have this system. So you have to, you, you, you register with Secretary of State. Secretary of State gives you a P.O. box in Jeff City and then gives you a number. So then you have this little card and you vote with that card. And the only thing I give out is the P.O. box address, which is controlled solely by the Secretary of State. And so an abuser can't find a victim through the voter registration rolls. Because voter registration rolls are public record. So you know, somebody says, hey, Kurt, I want to know who's registered to vote in St. Charles County. I say, here's the record. I do not share socials. I do not share phone numbers. And I do not share emails. Email and phone number are optional things for you to put in your record, which I appreciate you to do. Because if I have an issue, I would like to be able to contact you so I can resolve that issue as opposed to sending you to, um, a piece of mail to an address you no longer live in. Um, but, you know, you, you know, your name, your address, everything you'd find in a phone book, all that's public record. So I have to tell people, here's who's registered to vote in St. Charles County. Um, all right, so these are all absentee reasons. All right, now, in-person absentee voting. Basically, you have to have the same reasons to in-person vote at my office as you would to ask for an uh, absentee ballot by mail. But the rest of the process works more or less like it does election day. You, 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 you provide identification. We process you through the iPad. The only difference is the iPad has like one extra step because you still have to give your reason. You're basically, you're applying for the absentee ballot. I'm going to give you the next you know, 20 seconds. Um, and then we go through the process of voting. Now, one thing that the legislature tried to pass this last year, uh, one thing that the um, Clerk Association really wants to see is what's called no excuse absentee voting. All right. And that is anybody can absentee vote without a reason, which is very similar to early voting, but slightly different. All right. So no excuse absentee voting and early voting. In a way, they're the same thing. The biggest difference is no excuse absentee voting still requires the voters come to the election authority office and vote for a 
designated time period. All right. Um, the statute that Missouri was trying to pass was for in-person only, no excuse absentee. So if you wanted an absentee ballot by mail, you still had to have one of those six reasons. But if you just wanted to come in and vote early, then you could. Um, even though absentee voting is six weeks long, the legislature had a three week before the election time frame. But early voting is more or less the same as election day voting for a span of time leading up to an election. All right. Um, so there's no need to give an excuse. When you show up to the polls election day, you don't have to have an excuse. You're a voter. You just go and vote. Same thing with early voting. You just show up to, to vote. All right. Um, so so the, the biggest difference with early voting is that early voting time frames, it's by mail or in person. So you just ask for an absentee. You don't have to ask for an absentee ballot. You just have to ask for a ballot by mail. Uh, there's generally a time period. Uh, some states, only 10 days lead up to the election, you can early vote. Other states, it could be several weeks up to the election. Again, this federal law that I referenced at the beginning, uh, the, the Freedom to Vote Act, mandates minimum of 15 days, including weekends, uh, for early voting for all states. Um, but the process is the same. The other thing that a lot of states who do early voting have is what's called vote centers, where instead of having one location for each precinct, okay, we vote at the middle school, we vote at the church down the street, we vote at the library, they have vote centers. They'll have a larger space where anybody within the county can go to. And so maybe it's the convention center. Maybe it's the, you know, the, maybe they set up a big conk and tent out at the Schnooks uh, parking lot or something and then just run generators. And so you have a place where anybody can go and they can vote. And so you're not tied to a location. So it's just early voting. Um, typically, the election authority office is always a place where people can vote. Um, so all of these things, you know, early voting definitely focuses a lot on accessibility. Uh, the process is pretty much the same for early voting or in-person absentee voting as it is election day, so most people generally consider it to be secure. All right, now, how can you participate? This is my sales pitch. You can become an election judge. If you are a registered voter in St. Charles County, I can use you as an election judge. I don't care what party you are, because I need both. Um, and so, and I'll pay you $145 for the day, plus $30 for training. So you get paid to go to class. Anyway, so this is a way that you can participate. I'd love it. The other way is update your voter registration. If you've moved, I, even if you've moved across the street, because streets are a great place to change a line, I need you to update your voter registration so that I give you your correct ballot. Otherwise, I send you the long line on election day. All right. Other ways to participate. There's what's called challengers and watchers. I don't like these people because they challenge and watch me. But it's all part of the process, so I have to allow it. Um, these people represent the parties. To be a challenger or watcher, the chair of the Central Committee, Republican Central Committee or Democrat Central Committee. By the way, in St. Charles County, the chair of the Democratic Central Committee is Morton Todd, really nice guy. And the chair of the Republican Central Committee is Dave Zucker. Ah, he's also a nice guy. Um, so those are the two chairs of the, of the Central Committees. They are the party. Um, they don't do a whole lot unless, like, like a state rep died, and then they had to appoint somebody to run in a special election. That's what they do. Um, but they also get to pick who are the challengers watchers. So a challenger gets to go to a polling place and watch the process. And if they see illegal or inappropriate activity occurring at a polling place, they first go to the election judges and say, hey, this is occurring, and it's a violation of statute. And if they don't like the response that the election judge gives them, then they are told to call me and say, hey, I'm at this polling place, and your judges are doing this. They're demanding driver's license, which is the most egregious offense that my guys typically do. The reason my judges ask for driver's license is because it's faster. It's easier. So they're like, I want the driver's license, because the iPad will scan that real quick, and then everything works nicely. Again, you don't have to have a driver's license to vote in St. Charles County. And my judges are told not to ask for one. They're told to ask for a valid ID. They like driver's license because they're fast. Anyway, so then I call up the election judge. Hey, guys, by the way, remember your training. You can't ask for a driver's license. Um, but we like it. It's faster. The other thing was uh, masks. Trump mask, Biden mask, electioneering. You know, yeah, I, 
uh, sidebar. So I, uh, I had to enforce the electioneering law. In, in Missouri, you cannot electioneer. You can't campaign inside a polling place or inside you know, my office or within 25 feet of the door. And so we actually use, was it the building next door is the one that we use as a polling place, the auditorium? And so there's the, the side door. So 25 feet from that door, there can't be any campaign signs, no people with t-shirts or whatnot. Well, I mean, obviously with, you know, with COVID, the masks became a bigger issue or obviously the ball caps are always an issue. And so every once in a while I had to tell somebody to take off their Trump mask. And then of course they get all upset with me. I'm like, yes, I'm the Republican director. You know, take off your Trump mask. Just play by the rules. And so I had one guy, he was so mad at me that I made him take off his Trump mask that he then paraded around my building with a Trump flag for like th that afternoon. I'm like, I'm glad he had plenty of time on his hands. And then across the street, there was a, uh, a, uh, a sign because the his property was up for sale. He put his Trump flag in front of my office, you know, on, on that, on that, uh, that sign. Like for, it stayed up there for a couple days. I left it alone because I wasn't going to take it down, um, which just amused me. He thought I was some sort of like, you know, Trump painting fanatic who was, you know, telling him to, to squelch his free speech. I'm like, no, just not inside my office while you're voting. That's all I ask. You know, free speech is great except for inside my polling place. Anyway, but, you know, if you want to make sure that people, you know, follow those electionary laws, you can be a challenger. Or you can be a watcher. The difference is the watchers come to my, po my place and watch me count the va ballots election night or count the uh, absentee ballots. In the November election with COVID and the increased uh, absentee ballot, uh, it took us 14 hours to count all of the ballots. And that was with my high-speed scanner. We just had so many. And we had one challenger, or one watcher, she sat there and watched the whole process. She was a trooper. I mean, it was so boring. I mean, it's basically just running pieces of paper through a scanner. And the scanner counts it all up. And then, you know, anyway. And then we boxed it all up, and we did the next section. And, you know, we had my bipartisan team, and we had the technician running the machine, and we had the watcher. And she just sat there for 14 hours watching the process. Um, Afterwards, she's like, hey, that was really interesting. I'm like, I'm glad you found that fascinating. Um, anyway. Yeah, so challenges watchers, unpaid. Election judges, I pay you. Um, so, yeah, it, you can also be a challenger watcher any election. Pretty much the presidential elections are the ones that people care about. So, aside from that, there's usually not anybody. Um, yeah, you're allowed to be close to the judges, you can be close to the process, not allowed to talk to voters, not allowed to touch ballots, you know, I think it's six feet, um, you know, well, you'd be close enough you can hear. Um, I had an issue where, you know, one of my, my judges are like, oh, fine, you can be a challenger, but you gotta go sit way over there, and they called, and I had to call the judge, no, you know, you have to let them be close, you know, they obviously they can't be breathing down your neck, you know, social separation, but, you know, they still get to see. All right, um, the other thing is, you can come and go, but the idea is, you know, I give you a, every watcher or challenger a, a little form. It says, hey, this person's been nominated by their party's central committee chair. They are allowed to be at this polling place. And I sign it, and they give that to them. And then they show that to the, to the head judges. And then uh, they're allowed to come and go, but they're not allowed to just like, you know, just, you know we allow them to go get a you know, you know, lunch break or something. Uh, but they're, you, know, you can't just go to like any polling place you want. You're like locked into like one location. Anyway, so that's the challengers and the watchers. Again, this is a focus on security. It originally started, these challengers and watchers, back in the days when they were really challenging whether or not somebody was allowed to, to cast a ballot for a particular party. You know, back when the parties had, you know, they knew who their members were, and they policed that more. And so they'd be like, no, you can't give that person a Democratic ballot. That's a Republican. And, or you can't let this Republican pull a Democrat ballot. And so that's what they, this all started for. Anyway, they're not allowed to challenge that. It's an open election. You can pull any ballot you want you know, on a primary election. You're only allowed one. People complain. It's like, I want to vote for this person and that person. I'm like, well, you get to pick which party you play in. You get, you're allowed one. All right. Oh, oh the other thing. You can vote. Um, St. Charles County is generally considered pretty good with uh, voter turnout. Over the last 12 elections, we're averaging 32%. So if you want to be a part of the minority, vote. Um, the smallest election was actually the first one I ran, 9.74% turnout. Obviously, the biggest was the most recent presidential, 76% turnout. Um, in St. Charles County, we have almost 92% of those 18 plus are registered to vote. So we're doing pretty good as far as you know, people registering to vote. Less good on people than actually voting. 
the fun thing about the statistics about April elections, the municipal election, school board elections, generally the voters who vote in school board elections, they're more likely to have grandkids in school than they are kids. Anyway, and then my last slide. If you want to contact us, if you want to be an election judge, uh, you can go to my website, there's a form there, or you can just email us at electionjudge at sccmo.org. Um, every address in St. Charles County government is at sccmo.org. And then generally it's first initial, last name, most of the time. Um, or election judge in this case. Or if you want an absentee ballot, it's election absentee. I try to make things simple and simplistic. Anyway, I totally wasn't paying attention to my watch, so I don't know how much time we have for Q&A, but I know I left some. Yes, we do. <clears throat> Thank you very much for that very specific uh, detail about security and accessibility. It's five minutes until the hour. We officially have until quarter after the hour. Uh, this is the time for questions and comments. I'll run around the room so we can all hear your question. But yeah, let's hear from you, the good people. Mr. Bob, I've got two questions. One, what caused the spike in the August 2020 election to 28%? Was that the school board referendum for St. Francis Howell, $244 million? Medicaid. We're talking about August of 2020 or yes. August of 18? 2020 was the Medicaid expansion. Oh, on the, uh, on the March 2020. I'm sorry, not August, March 2020. March, March would have been the presidential preference primary. Okay. Yeah, so that's, it just, it was the, you know, the, really it was mostly, you know, the Democratic vote or people wanting to vote for Trump, but it was presidential preference primaries, the March election. So and the that, second, and the yes, second question, would you know what the typical voter turnout is in a school board election? Well, so typically it's April, you know, April elections are the municipal elections. And so school board, fire board, uh, city ward, all of those. And so, yeah, we're, I mean, we're looking at close to 10, maybe 15%. So last year, in June 2020, was the municipal election. We were at 14.62%. Um, and, so and so we generally have very low turnouts for municipal elections. The, the governments that affect your life more directly, nobody votes on. Anyway, so we have a... Other hand. I just want to say, uh, first, uh, definitely very informative. Just uh, knowing about the process. Um, I would just, I just want to know your like uh, your views on certain uh, issues. Like, um, I know voter accessibility and security obviously um, are can be a very uh, interesting discussion when it, in regards to like partisan politics. Mm -hmm. And, and you're a Republican, I was wondering what your, um, what your take was on the discourse and also like specifically um, the, the, what I would consider voter suppression laws uh, in legislatures like Georgia and Texas um, and similar things that I, I think certain members of your party would uh, support. And especially of color, I would be concerned about people of color's access to voting. I'm sorry, did you ask about voter suppression or did you ask about a specific voter law? So the reason I refer as security and accessibility is because both values have merit. Both values must be protected. People must have access to the polls. The election results and the polling places must be kept secure. So then the question becomes a, a policy issue of how much security is good, how much security becomes problematic. How much accessibility is good, how much accessibility is problematic. There are some people who greatly distrust and greatly dislike mailing absentee ballots to uh, voters in addresses that they no longer live in. In St. Charles County, we have about 280,000 registered voters. 
about 20,000 of them are inactive. And if you recall, an inactive voter means they're registered, but I'm pretty sure they've moved and they no longer live at the address at which they're registered to. So if I mailed a ballot to every, regist to every registered voter, I'm pretty sure 20,000 ballots would be sent to addresses that they don't live in. And then how many of those would be returned to me, voted, whether or not it was that person. So there is a question of, of security. It's very accessible, but is it secure? And both accessibility and security are values that are important. Um, and then you have the issue of you know, who gets to register to vote. I, I talked a little bit about you know, Vermont voting people in prison. Most states generally don't vote active incarcerated people, but whether or not they're in prison or not. So all of these are elements of of accessibility. And so I, I, I talk more in broad terms. So I don't know, like, I forget what it was that, that Texas recently did. I've been busy doing uh, other things locally. So I don't know what law you're talking about. So unfortunately, security and accessibility can be, because, I mean, security can be strict and can be deemed suppression. But is it really, or is it simply, because it really, if you're saying this person can't register to vote, you're suppressing that person's ability to, to vote. But maybe they're 12 years old. We're like, yeah, we don't want 12 year olds kind of deciding the fate of our country. So that could be a good thing. Now, obviously, we've determined 18 is the age to vote. So not allowing 18 year olds to register would be problematic. Um, but I don't know like, if you have like, a specific law that you want me to talk about policy on. I know, like, I think Georgia, uh, with Georgia, there was, um, I think they dropped it from the bill, um, but it was originally planned to, like, something cut, cut early, like, Sunday early voting hours, which typically, um, I guess, was affecting, like, black churchgoers, at least that's what the discourse was, and also, I think, um, well, there's also, like, the whole thing with not allowing people to give snacks and water to people in line, which is, I thought was stupid, but, um, and also, I think in Texas, they were trying to cut, um, I'm, I think it was either ballot drop boxes mm -hmm. uh, to like one in the entire county in Harris mm -hmm. County, which is predominantly Democrat in the city of Texas. So I, I'm, I guess I was just wondering your opinion on so, that. So well, ballot drop boxes is an interesting concept. We don't have them in Missouri. We don't. In Missouri, because you have to vote absentee, you have to have a reason to vote absentee. Most people have to have their ballot notarized to make sure that they get notarized. They, they, if they bring it in person, I want to make sure that that's, it's notarized. So my staff can notarize their absentee ballot. If they simply throw it in a ballot drop box and it's not notarized, I'm going to have to reject that ballot. But if they give it to my staff and they say, oh, let me double check, okay, yep, you're good to go, I can count the ballot. And so by not having drop boxes, by, by having the voters give it to me at my office in person, I can be sure to count more ballots, not less. But again, that's an issue of security. If we didn't have the requirement to have a notary on the uh, returned ballot envelopes, then certainly you know, drop boxes could be more accessible. You also have the, the concern of people you know, damaging the, the, the ballots inside the box or trying to steal the box, and that's a whole other fun story. Um, but the problem with discourse is if somebody favors accessibility, and they see anything that favors security as suppression, that harms the, the discourse. If people focus, they favor heavily security, and they see anything moving towards accessibility, uh, no excuse, in-person absentee voting, that can, if they see that change as just bad, that harms the discourse. My point, my goal is to say, accessibility and security are both important values within the election administration. We can, deter we can decide or disagree on, on extremes of where is it too accessible, where is it not secure enough to secure. But you know, to, to simply say security suppression, accessibility is, is you know, let the Russians decide our elections. Those become the issue where I say discourse is, is problematic. Kurt, could you speak to what's happening in Arizona with the private company, uh, <laughs> Cyber Ninjas? My question <sighs> is, how did a judge okay that? Mm -hmm. And number two, what does that do to the privacy of the vote? Uh, because I would expect you to not uh, be able to, say if I were from the Karl Marx 
Improvement Association of St. Charles County, and I say I want to, I want access to the ballots, mm -hmm. I would expect to be refused. You would be. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. good. So, but what so, happened? How did that happen? So uh, fortunately, I happened to be in Maricopa County just recently for a national election center conference, and the uh, head director there gave us a little presentation. The poor guy, he had gotten appointed just before the November election, or just before the, you know, so he'd only been there recently, he was in charge, and that happened. So what happened in, in Arizona? Maricopa County, Phoenix, Arizona, Scottsdale, Arizona, is about 60% of the voters of the state of Arizona are that one county. All right, so Maricopa, Maricopa, Maricopa County is, in essence, Arizona. And it went for Biden overall. Obviously, the Trump supporters were upset, and they thought that this was an issue of fraud. So the state Senate of Arizona decided that they were going to subpoena the, voter, the, the ballots and have a, a recount. So they appropriated $150,000, and they hired this company called the Cyber Ninjas or whatever they were. Um, however, the, the, the process of doing a manual recount is labor-intensive, and it's complicated, because you have an issue of, of uh, voter intent. You, you know, you know, again, my machine reads the circle, or reads that little target. It doesn't look at anything on the ballot but that target. If it's dark, it record, records as a vote. If it's not dark, it doesn't record as a vote. So if you circle the target but don't fill it in, it's not going to count that, that vote. If you circle you know, Trump and Biden, it's going to say, I don't know which one you really want, so I'm going I'm to I'm give no vote for that race, but that counts everything else. If, however, you scratched out Trump's name, you circled Biden's name, so the human eye can be like, oh, voter intent is Biden, not Trump, then you know, in a manual recount, that's why the numbers will change, is because voters do weird things, and the human eye can see that where the machine can't. So the state Senate in Arizona subpoenaed the, the ballots, wanted to do this recount. They quickly blew through the appropriate money. I don't know where the, the rest of the money came from, some foreign, not foreign, some other source, private money, uh, funded these cyber ninjas. So they you know, were going through the, the machines, which, have, which is a problem with, the, with their own security with Maricopa. I think they have to buy all new voting machines now, uh, which is crazy expensive, because they have like two and a half million voters or something, they have a lot of machines. Um, and so they went through all of these records, and they, used, they were doing this manual recount. It took them weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. Um, it took them a long, long time, much longer than they thought it would. And then they said, okay, we're finally done. And I don't think they've ever yet res uh, reported the results, which means they didn't get the result they wanted. And so they're keeping quiet about it because they found out, you know what, sometimes the voters, they change their mind. And sometimes they, like St. Charles County, we voted for Trump, but we voted for Trump at a lesser percentage than Trump got four years before. And so I have people saying that I have rampant fraud in St. Charles County because fewer voters voted for Trump in a percentage-wise this time than they did four years ago. I'm like, well, maybe that's because, I don't know, the Democrat candidates. I mean, Hillary wasn't the most popular candidate four years ago. Um, and Trump wasn't the most popular Republican this year. So any female Republican voters like, I don't want to vote for that guy. They're in St. Charles County. He's going to win here. I don't have to vote for him. I mean, if you look at St. Charles County's ballots, you'll see that for governor is more than president, lieutenant governor more than governor, secretary of state more than lieutenant governor. Republicans just didn't vote for the president, but they voted down ticket. If you look at the Democrat ballots, you'll see that the number of votes for Biden and then Galloway, high. Everything else, they just stopped voting. I don't know why the parties vote that way, but that's just how they vote. So in Maricopa, they had a, the state Senate subpoenaed the ballots and the machines. They paid for this election, got private dollars to pay for the rest of it. And then the, election, the results of the audit have yet to be released. I always release the results of my audit immediately. It's just what we do. And then, of course, they had the issue of, oh, this thing happened and it's wrong. I'm like, no, that's just the process. And, and, and so chain of custody was a huge issue. These people touching ballots. It, it was... It was very problematic, the way that this recount was done. Um, and so I hope that you know, Missouri doesn't try to do anything like that. There is a call. So there's people who supported that, who are trying to get things like that to happen here in Missouri or uh, other places. They're really trying to undo. They want, they want the election uncertified. 
and redo the election. Not going to happen. But that's what they want. Um, unfortunately for me, the lack of trust in the election is problematic to the whole democratic process. Four years ago, it was more people on the left who were concerned about fraud. Now it's people on the right. This won't go away until you know, 24. And then I don't know which group will be mad. Some group is going to be mad. They're not going to like the results. It's my job to run elections best I can and be as open about the process as possible. And so I just want people to recognize security and accessibility are both values that need to be respected for good discourse. And we can disagree on how much security or how much accessibility. But this gentleman has the mic, and he had a question. Uh, yes. Um, you hear stories occasionally of boxes of ballots being found in the trunks of cars or on the side of the road. And maybe I missed it, but could you go over what the chain of custody of ballots is sure. after the polls close? Sure. So after a poll closes, you know, we had, I showed you the picture of our, our little machine. So we have the, typically each precinct has one OVO, all right? And then that box will, will hold 5,000 ballots. So generally that one machine holds all the ballots, all right? So after the polls close, you know, the last voter is, is gone, then the election judges tear down and pack up all of the stuff. They take all the voted ballots and they put it in these cardboard boxes and they wrap a seal over, basically it's a big, bump, big bumper sticker, they wrap a seal over it, put their, put their they, they sign it, they put the, the, which precinct it's from, and then they seal it up. So and a seal is easily broken, but the whole point is, if anybody were to open that box, we would know it because it was broken. All right, it's, it's not so much securing it, keeping it from being able to be tampered, it's securing it that if tampering occurred, we would know. And then the, each of those machines has a thumb drive. That thumb drive is a tabulation of that precinct's results. And so the election judges, they pull out that thumb drive, they pull out all the vote ballots, and then any of those provisional, yellow, blue, provisional ballots, affidavits, anything other important paperwork, they bring that back to my office election night. And then we take all of those thumb drives, we put it into our air-gapped, very high-tech Linux laptop, and then we tabulate up the election results, and then we take that information from a clean thumb drive, and then put it into a county computer and update our website. Here's the election results. And they're always unofficial, because I still have to go through all the provisional ballots, or any absentee ballots by military guys who come back three days later. You know, all, all these things. So it's never, election night's never a done deal. It, it's always close, but it's never final. And we have two weeks to certify the election to make sure we've counted all the legit ballots. Um, but the judges are told to give us all the ballots and to give us the, the little receipt that the machine prints out with the election results as well as the thumb drive, which has the election results. And so we have all of that paperwork. If they forget any of that paperwork, we send them back. You know, there's been times where we've had to, we don't break doors down, but we've had to find the custodian to get back access because, you know, they you know, forgot something that was important. And the rest of the stuff we gather up the next day or two after the election, we bring back all the voting booths and the iPads and stuff, and we, of course, have to go through all that. And we'll go through our booths. We'll just make sure that the election judge didn't happen to find a ballot, you know, that, you know, was, was left in a random spot and then stick in our, you know. <laughs> I, had, I had one judge. Like, oh yeah, by the way, we started closing up. There was three people still voting, so here's their ballots. It didn't go through the machine because we closed the machine down too soon. I'm like, great, thanks. We counted those ballots, obviously. Um, but, you know, and, you know, I appreciate them telling me. I'm like, what? You know, so, you know, so then, of course, when we had the verification board, I had to tell the Republican Democrat representatives, oh, by the way, our number's off by three because here's what our judge did. Um, anyway, so, um, so, you know, these, these are all the. So, chain of custody. So, we. <laughs> Yeah, we don't have these random boxes just lying around. They, they all, so the, we have a process where once some stuff is brought in, we double check it, and then we record it, and there's always a record of all of our, our stuff. It's same with our absentee ballots. You know, we, we keep all the absentee ballots in one location, and then as we process them, as we vote them or count them or, and then store them, they're always kept in one location. We don't have boxes of ballots just lying around. I'd fire people for that. Um, so I know we're getting late. Is it, are we done? Yeah, I, I just wanted to kind of follow up. I think one of the concerns about, I, I, I totally agree with your concerns about accessibility versus security. And I, one of the, a couple of things that, that Texas and other states have done that don't make sense to me for security is they've banned, for example, 24-hour voting or re reduce early voting, mm -hmm. which has no effect on security whatsoever. It's, it reduces accessibility. Well, again, early voting is typically also by mail as well. well I mean, in person. In person. In person. The 24-hour okay. 
uh, in, in Texas, in Houston, they had 24 hours, you could drive up 24 hours a day and vote mm -hmm. for okay. people who worked all day, nursing shifts and whatever, who were just okay. too busy mm -hmm. to vote, and they've blocked that. And to me, that makes no sense whatsoever from a security point of view. It's simply trying to reduce accessibility, which I think is shocking. Yeah, I, honestly, I wasn't paying attention to that change in their, their law. So I didn't know any state had 24-hour voting. I mean, that's, the, that's what it is. No, they don't offer it. Yeah, yeah, the staffing, trying to figure out staffing for that. that I mean, that would be my biggest concern, not making it accessible for voters, but just, you know, not, not burning out my staff would be my, my number one concern. We are at time's limit. All right. Uh, 75 minutes is all we have. I wish we could continue the conversation because this has been very, very good. So let's uh, have a hand clap for our guest, <laughs> Director of Elections, Kurt Barr. Thank you very, very much. And stick around. We've got a 2.30 panel, Critical Race Theory, Under the Lamp.